putting siding on the house next to me on this side of the house. So if you hear any thumping and bumping, that's what the activity is here. There is nobody else around me in the house. So good morning. Another new day with new cha challenges for me. Um, teaching the second time on Zoom, not my favorite thing to do, but I'm learning. And I hope I'm learning in recent months not to take things for granted. I think that when we finally get back to room three, five in, at Bethel, we will for a while at least be so grateful for the routine of getting together in person and having our coffee and things like that. So um, I also have been learning how fearfully and wonderfully made our bodies are. Um, I think n not until something goes wrong with them do we see how wonderfully they've made. Um, so this morning, it's another thing I realize I have to not take for granted. Um, for months now, I've been struggling with a Bell's palsy. Sorry. Um... I took talking clearly, um, swallowing, um, smiling for granted, and I don't do that anymore. So pray for me. Um, as we go to prayer today, I'd like us to spend our time using the Lord's Prayer, and I have that on your paper, the one he gave his disciples as a framework. So we'll, we'll, we'll say the headings, and then I would like you to pray things that relate to that. So let's see if we can try it. So together, let's say, Our Father in heaven, let your name be kept holy. Now, I would like you to pray, and I'll pray too, about acknowledging how great our God is and also his place and his holiness. So let's spend just a few minutes praising and thanking him for that. You can unmute for this. <laughs> Father, we praise you that you are El Shaddai. We praise you that you are everything to us. Where would we be without you? I cannot imagine. Praise you, Father. Praise you that you are all sufficient. Thank you even for this name in our chapter today. Praise you. Father, I praise you that you are Father Abba, that you want that kind of relationship with us, that you want us to be your children and to come to you and to trust you. And let's move on and do the next two together. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Let's pray about things that we would like to see happening in that God's kingdom here on earth, the way things are happening in heaven. Lord, how we would pray for righteousness and justice to prevail in our country, Father, in our world. We know that this ultimately won't happen until your kingdom does come on earth. But Father, until that time, we pray that you would raise up righteous men and women to lead. We pray that at all levels of government and in our down to our towns, Father, that there would be people that have a relationship with you that would 
have godly values, Lord. We pray that you would continue to show mercy to our country, Lord, and given us time to repent and change our ways. God, we pray that you would change people one by one, heart by heart. Turn them to you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know that in heaven, all are in your presence. And help us, Lord, here on earth to be so aware of your presence here too. And thank you that you are present here. And thank you that you came as Emmanuel to be with us. And now give us our daily bread today. Here, I would like you to pray your requests and the needs for yourself and others. If you want to pray some out loud, fine. If there are things you want to just pray quietly, pray that. Thank you, Father, for providing food for us. We do know that there are many people who need it, and we pray that you would provide it for them also. And thank you for your word, which is our spiritual bread. Help us, Lord, to spend time eating that and learning from that too. And Lord, I do pray for those who are without jobs because of COVID and other situations. Help their needs to be met. Help us, Lord, to know where to reach out and how to help others. And now we'll move on to uh, repentance. And so forgive us as we forgive others. Silently pray to your Pray to the Lord, asking forgiveness for yourself and also to be able to forgive others. And now for direction to help us not to be tempted. Don't allow us to be tempted. Instead, rescue us from the evil one. Once again, silently ask God to help you in the areas you are struggling with right now. And pray silently for specific ones who you know are being enticed by the evil one. And I know this last part is not in the original Greek, but I, we will say it. Say it with me. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, glory. forever. Now, when we say amen, we're saying absolutely. So be it. Beyond a doubt. Yes. Do I say amen like that at the end of my prayers? Or I am, am I more likely to say, like a small child in church, you know, when the pastor's preaching and all of a sudden a kid goes, amen, because they want the service to be over. Is that the way we end our prayers? Or do we end it with a resounding yes? So right now, I would like you, where you are, to say amen two times for emphasis at the end of this amazing prayer. Amen. 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 Well, Emily gave us just a short verse last week. So we will say that short verse three times together today and think about the words that it says. Starting with where it's found, Genesis 15:6. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Again, Abram believed the Lord, 
and credit it to him as righteousness. One more time. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Um, notice his name is still Abram in this verse. And yet we are all, we constantly have been hearing about his faith. Let's pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus this morning, I pray that you will instruct us and teach us in the way we should go. Counsel us with your eye upon us. And may we serve you today in your name. Amen. All right. Um, we've been moving along with Abram. Uh, I don't think we know exactly when he left Ur. Too bad for me, you know. But... We do know that he was 75 when he left Tehran. And in today's uh, lesson, we realize that he's been living for 10 years in Canaan. So we're gonna be at about 85, which makes Sarai about 75. And our passage did say, if you, I had to ask on your homework, he was 86 when Ishmael was born, and he was 99 when he was told to circumcise all the males and also when he's going to be told about Isaac. And, of course, we know he's 100 when Abram is born, which makes Sarai 90. So, I think it's interesting that God gives these specifics when so many times we don't get these kinds of specifics. But I think he wanted us to know this, especially I think how old Isaac and Sarah are at this time. Uh, like we said in the past, something that hit me in looking at some of my chronology things is that Noah could have still been alive when Abram moved to Canaan. And I didn't realize, but there are traditional stories about how Noah and Abram might have met and spent time together, but it's not in the Bible. So I guess it's not important, but just an interesting thing to think about. So let's take a real quick look back at some of our chapters about we, what we've been learning about Abram, if you remember in chapter 11, we had that genealogy and he was in the line of which one of Noah's descendants? Right, Shem. He was in the line of Shem. And I thought it was interesting in, in chapter 11 where it says, you know, that Terah fathered Aram, Nahor, and Haran. And then it goes through and it says, the name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And in verse 30, it said, now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Isn't that an interesting thing to put in a list of the ancestors? So you see how important it was that the, that the people would know this. Remember, these are the... Moses is writing this to the people who are ready to go into um, Canaan after they've been in the wilderness. And Emily taught, told us how in Acts 7, 3 then, it says that then and 4, then he went out of the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him there into this land in which he was now living. So we saw that change. Then in chapter 12, we read, read how he left Haran after his father's death, and we saw how he took with him Sarai, Lot, all the people he had acquired in Haran, and all his possessions. And he got to Canaan, and then in that chapter 2, we heard about that side trip to Egypt. And in 15, last week, we saw that pivotal chapter where we get some more of the covenant revealed. Now, when I used to teach first grade, 
especially because it was first grade, I like to have teach with block, a sense of blocks. You know, those building blocks, the foundation, and just to get this, and then we move on to this, and then we move on to this. Now, you and I know that it doesn't happen quite like that. When we're building, there's often a Lego block that's missing. And I, when I uh, taught at Adult Literacy Council, when I tutored, I realized how vital some of those missing blocks were for the people because they had struggled with just not knowing a certain thing. I remember one woman who got so excited when she, she finally could do long division. And she was from the South and she goes, I can divide. <laughs> and she was just so thrilled that she could do that. And so learning isn't just the building blocks. Well, when I went back to teaching the second time, when the kids were gone, by then the theory was you teach it in a spiral method. You teach something, give them a whole bunch of information, hope they pick something up, and then come back to it again, and then teach it again, and hope they pick something up. Well, that was hard for me to teach that way. But that was kind of the thing. Um, but in thinking about how God teaches us, I think he uses both of those things. I think he sets that foundation. He lays that foundation. He knows, though, that we are going to have those missing blocks that we miss. And so he comes around and repeats and keeps instructing. And we saw today in our study in, in preparation, he keeps adding and adding and adding to what he's teaching them. He's the perfect teacher. He knows all the kids, all of our learning styles. He has a perfect answer for us. Well, if we would have groups, I would have liked to have you share what you had found in the promises made in Genesis 12, 13, and 15 to Abram. Um, I gave you some of what I have there. I'd like you to take about two minutes, a minute or two, to look over that. And if you did do the homework, look and see if you have anything in yours that I missed. And also while you're looking, try to see how, what things were added. Okay, so in about just a couple of minutes, review what I gave you, review what you had, and then we're going to try to bring it all together. Okay, what are some of the blessings, and you can write these down in that box I left for you. What are some of the blessings that these promises gave to Abram, and God gave to Abram? Or just tell me the promise. He's giving descendants that will last forever, offspring that will continue forever. Okay, so there's that, that promise of an offspring. 
And last, uh, was it last week, uh, we, that the offspring would be his own. That, that was a big part. Our memory verse in, in 12 had a lot of things. Some of the very, ba those basic blocks were there. And then the 13th chapter seems to bring the land and the people um, promised. And I love in 15 where he says, I'm your shield. That's a real blessing. Your great reward. And um, so th there are all these, but, and, oh, and that he would live long and die in peace. That was something that was promised to him. The other uh, big thing, uh, Deb, was the offspring was the numerous. It says numerous, you know, like when we're talking about, remember, the sand, the, dust of the earth and the stars in the sky. We were out last night looking at the space station going across. You had like six minutes you could see it going. And it, it's a mess in the city. There's way too much light. But in trying to find that, you kept seeing, oh, that's a star. That's not the space. Oh, that's a star. But think about it, like uh, Emily said, if you're in a place where it's total dark, so many offspring were promised. Well, today we will see another step in the promises and the directive of, directives of God's covenant with Abram. Um, so once again, this is he's adding to the spiral along with those strong, firm building blocks below. Walton says that chapters 13 to 15 dealt with the obstacles and the advancement. And melancholy me stuck with the obstacles. I wish now that I had gone through, I told you the obstacles in your handout. I wish I had gone through and added a list of the advancements. Maybe you can stop me along the way and put those in for me. But it says, Obstacles and advancements in 13 to 15 were about the land, that God would give them the land. 16 to 21, we have the obstacles and the advancements of the promises regarding his family. So Abram's faith has been developed and tested. In his and Sarai's eyes, this is a long delay. So they choose an alternative. I'd like you to read verses one to four to yourself and think about how you would like to have been in their tents. So what do you think uh, Sarah's voice sounded like in that tent? It says she, he heard Sarah's voice. Probably not a real happy one, right? Probably many tears and frustration. But she had a plan. One that Christians in our time don't feel very, is very appropriate. Um, as many of you know, though, it was not unusual in that culture to do this, to have the servant be the surrogate parent of a child so that you could have a child. Um, I never saw this before, but it's generally assumed that Hagar was, I think maybe we did mention it the other week in the lesson, but before we studied this time, I didn't realize it, that Hagar was probably, came along from Egypt because in 1216, it says that the Pharaoh had given, had given, he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, 
female servants and female donkeys. So she was probably one of those female servants given by the Pharaoh to Abram. And Sarah knows that God is in control of her fertility, but she turns right around and tries to correct it herself. The obstacle to God's design rises up as she decides to help out in a perfectly appropriate way for her culture. She can have her servant have a child with her husband and then raise that child. And nobody would thought that was terrible to do. Now, there are some very interesting things that happened with this conception. Um, even having the wife being present at the conception was common. Even, this is just so gross, the wife sitting with the servant on the top while the husband helped her to conceive so that this child would be her child. And it was often usual or it could be that the wife would be there when the child was born so that it was sort of taken out of her and this is her child. It's just like so weird for us to think of this, but this was the practice of them and it was followed, it says, all the way into the pre exilic time in the Near East, that they, that they were willing to do this. Now, it seems that our culture today does not put as strong of an emphasis on having an heir, but in this time, and in many cultures still, it is very important to have an heir from your family. Infertility is still a struggle in our culture today for, for many people, but to Sarah, the inability to conceive was, first of all, it was considered a punishment from God, her God, or even in general, all the gods that they were, the other people worshiped. She could be divorced for being infertile. So that would mean that she would lose all her support. She might be sent back to her father, one small consolation might be that she'd be able to take her dowry back with her. But it was bad to be infertile. Um, she could be under suspicion of deceit and behavior in her behavior, which caused the gods to be against her. And in Sarai's case, and I'm sure many others, there was contempt and frustration between the two women over the birth of the child when it occurred. Note that the fact that Hagar couldn't conceive with Abram meant that she was probably the reason for the, uh, uh, Sarah was probably the reason for the infertility between them. And so, um, one said, in her culture, by mothering the child of a wealthy, influential man like Abram, this servant girl would gain a higher status than Sarai. So there's a lot going on in Sarai and her life and how she's feeling. And remember, she is, what, uh, going to be, we don't, that she doesn't know, it, but she's going to be like 90, almost 90 years old till she conceives. So we're not talking about infertility where people have been trying for months and they can't have a baby. We're talking about years and years. Um, so keep these concepts in mind as we continue to study this triangle and the child. And we see this obstacle that she and Abram put in God's plan. To they try to have an heir of their own. I don't know that Abram really saw himself as doing totally wrong. I guess if we believe he should have had faith in God, he definitely was in the wrong. But 
I, it hit me and if we had time, we could discuss more. How many things in our culture do we accept and go along with, even if it isn't what God's plans would be? I think we could, we could see that happening today. Now, Sarah had plans to help Abram have the child and God prom that God promised him by someone other than himself. Now, to be fair, where it isn't until chapter 17 that they find out who the mother will be. So it is a very difficult thing, this thing of waiting. Sarah planned to take care of what God had done. What God had not done, uh, Hugh says, and I think that sort of seems to be the case, but we know that Abram went along with it. Now, take that last sheet of your, um, it, it should be on the back-to-back -back sheet of your thing out, and put the promises and choices paper alongside of your other paper pages because we're going to go back and forth between these. Um, I have who is a person giving and who is receiving the promise and who is a person making the choice. In verses one to four, do you see any promises given? Well, I didn't. Did you? Did you see one, uh, Aaron? Um, in verses one through four, the the last verse, verse four, he promises an heir of his own flesh and blood. Okay, so put so God promises an heir of his own. Yeah, I'm sorry, I I did this a while ago. So and then. What choices, who made choices in verses one to four? I'm sorry, I looked at the wrong chapter. <laughs> okay, I was thinking, I was thinking, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to keep track of three things here. Right, okay, so I don't see a promise in one to four. What choices are made and who makes choices in one to four? Sarah makes a choice, a big choice, to give her maid to Abram. Abram makes a choice to follow her advice. And I guess you could say that Hagar even makes the choice to be compliant. Not that she might have had a, a big say yeah, in it, but I'm she not, I'm not sure that she had a choice uh, yeah. in, in the culture of the day. So I, I didn't list that as a choice. Um, she does make some other choices in the future, but I don't, I don't necessarily think if we were enmeshed in that culture and if we were a slave, I'm not sure that we would have felt we had the choice. Maybe she wanted it too, you know? <laughs> I don't know. She lived with this man pretty closely. Well, anyway, we move on now to verses five and six to 6a. And Sarah, I said to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked at me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her. These are some very powerful times of emotion, some very strong emotions here. It's a very messy triangle. The hard thing to believe is that these Yahweh followers were the ones who set this triangle up. But before we get too judgmental, remember they've been waiting 10 years it's going to be at least another 13 years till they find out exactly when they will have the child. 
So I think we have to keep putting that bit of information in with what we're thinking about. One phrase I missed before I began reading the commentaries was, may the Lord judge between you and me. Sarah I knew who was in charge and she knew who the ultimate judge was. The Lord was watching as we shall see. Hugh says she is very aware of God's control. Now you are aware, I'm sure, that in general, the pagan gods were also considered to be in control of fertility of the people, of their animals, and all their crops. So this would not have been unusual for people to believe God was in control. But she is speaking, the Lord God, our God, would be the judge. Both Sarah and Abram know that God is unique in the, his way of coming to them and sharing his blessings, requiring both faith and obedience. And so Sarah is actually right when she puts some of the blame on Abram. He was the one to whom God had spoken and given the promises in 12 and 15, and he also went along with the culture of his day in telling Sarai to go ahead and do what she wanted to the slave, which she did. It's interesting, that word mistreated, I don't know what your translation has, but that mistreated word is the exact same word that was used of Pharaoh and what he did to the slaves in Egypt. That's a pretty mean word. Don? The way it hit me was, you know, they had just witnessed this covenant with God where he said to Abram, you know, 10 years earlier, <laughs> uh, you know, cut open the animals and they're expecting, okay, what's my part? What's my part? What's my part? And then God walks through and they heard and saw and felt and smelled that I'm never going to be able to keep this covenant. He doesn't, he knows I can't keep the covenant. He is going to keep the covenant for me. I am hopeless. That's what they, they heard and saw. And, and then 10 years later, Sarah and Abram, he is, he is guilty. He is sinful. <laughs> she right. is sinful because she presumes that she should take this into her own hands. She's not trusting that God still is going to keep the covenant completely by himself. I'm not able to. So it's just remarkable to me and so comforting to me. Right. Amen. Because I know I'm not able either. <laughs> and I would have done the exact same thing a lot earlier. You know, I mean, it's just, I would have, I know it, you know? And so it's just comforting to me to see them scrambling and trying to fix it again and not trusting that God has this for her to even say, uh, God has withheld my womb, made me barren, doesn't make sense. That shows that she trusts that he is in control of her womb, and she, he has closed it. So mm -hmm. why does she think that she has to still fix it? You know, and so it's just such a great picture of how it is for all of us. The struggle. The struggle. It's, it's, a, it's a impossible we're impossible. We can't know the mind of God and he will always be merciful and mm -hmm. grace filled every time. It's just amazing to me. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, I, and I, that was a comfort to me too. And, and kind of going back to that learning way of learning that God is willing to come around and reteach and retry and explain more. And he, he keeps doing that. So even though this is a situation she brought on to herself, it is a very difficult one. Now go back to your promises and choices for verses five to six A. Are there any promises in, the, in these two verse, or two verses? How about choices? Yeah. 
Did anybody choose anything? They're choosing their attitude. Mm -hmm. That's what pretty much what they are. Except, yeah, except when the action one is down with Sarai. When she deals harshly, she actually must be saying something or maybe even hurting her. I don't know. But we have Hagar, Sarai, Abram, all making choices here. Choosing to complain. Sarai chose to complain. And uh, Abram chose to listen. Well, now we move on to the running away and then the returning. Let's look at the map. You can see where um, she started up there around Hebron. She's going down, and we'll find out she's going down toward Shur. Um, Hagar is fleeing, though, and it says, and she, and she fled from her. She's pregnant, running away, and at this time, one commentator felt she was probably about 70 miles away in the desert, pregnant, uh, on her way, trying to go back home, probably. So, Emily, could you read verses 7 to 14? Oh, she left. Could someone read 7 to 14 for me? The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. I'm sorry, nine as well? All the way to 14. Oh, 14, okay. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your des descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to, to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me, for she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Ber Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Berid. So here comes this obstacle. Hagar flees. And when she flees, the fulfillment of Abram and Sarai's covenant promises are in jeopardy because the heir is going away. It's being taken away from them. Uh, now, even if they do wait for God to give them one, there's a possibility of a competition between the two that would be there. Um, remember, Ishmael would be the firstborn. And their whole plan for an heir is in jeopardy. I thought about all this gender reveal parties they have nowadays. Um, when she left and when Sarah kicked her out, they didn't, they didn't really know that it was a boy, right? But now she does. But it's just sort of interesting to put all these pieces together in your mind of what they, what's going through and think about it. Now, we could spend a lot of time about the angel of the Lord. And I don't have time now to discuss it. And I didn't have time to, you know, thoroughly go all this through all the places where it's been mentioned. But I did find one list of some of those cases where the angel of the Lord is mentioned. And who is this angel of the Lord? Once again, there are different ideas. Um, some feel that it is the pre-incarnate Christ who came and took to her. Or that, you know, that it was God himself. Others feel that it was an angel sent from God. 
I'm not going to vote. We're not going to vote on it. We're not going to decide now. We just know that no matter what, it is amazing that God, the God of creation, the God of Abraham comes and once again speaks to a person who worships idols. God spoke to Abram back when he was in that situation. And he's not, and she is not one of the chosen people that's been talked about now. She's from the line, probably from the line of Pam, not Sam. So the uh, angel of the Lord addresses her, stating her, her name and to whom she belongs. That must have been sort of a shock. You're out in the desert. This person comes and says to you these things and knows all this. And then he asks two questions. Where have you come from and where are you going? He doesn't really need this information. But maybe he wants her to know and think through what she's doing or what, what, where she thinks she's going. Um, it's kind of like the way you talk to your kids sometimes. What do you think you're doing? <laughs> and we know when they're little, we know what they were about to do. Well, God knew that too, and the angel of the Lord knew it. Well, and Jenny, that was, um, that was the way you greet someone in the village I lived in in Tanzania. Okay. Those are the two questions that you asked every person, where you come from, oh, where are you going? So I don't know, I mean, I have no idea, but that could also be part of a way to- Yeah. That would so have been maybe I've been such a shock to her. Maybe, I don't know. But, yeah. But look at the directives that are given to her. Return to your mistress and submit to her. Whoa. Do we understand how difficult that was for her to do that? She now knows she's carrying a boy. She has to go back, have this child, and have them raise it as theirs. Now, get out your promises chart again, just so it's ready, because Abram received six promises of having many children. Now, they're not all on the chart we have here. Um, in chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 15, chapter 17, and again, it will be in 18 and 22. What's interesting, Hagar is the only matriarch who gets all this information directly from God. She's the only one that God gives a direct message to the woman saying these things. This pagan, possibly pagan woman, gets all this from God. He reveals the gender, the name, the character, and the future of the child. Think about it, those of you who have had kids. What would it have been like when I was pregnant with Andrew if God would have told me his name and his character before he was born? It would have been interesting to see what I would have done. Um, it's, just, it, it's just so much, as I was studying it, so much to take in thinking about what was going on and how important it was what God was doing. And in 15 we read, and Hagar bore Abram, so we're assuming she went back, a son, and Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. And Ishmael means God hears, so it's kind of neat. God hears, God sees, and this, this servant girl is the one who's going to carry this out. So in your promises, let's keep on going and look at the who's giving a promise in verses, I'm sorry, uh, where do you start this? It's up to 15. A six to 15, who's giving promises and who's making choices?
Did anybody find any other promises than the ones I have on there? Because I definitely can miss some. Uh, one one thing there, that donkey, the wild donkey, it says it, I read it was mostly looked like a horse and it was used as a figure of a very individualistic lifestyle, not controlled by social convention. Kind of like what we talk about donkeys now. Um, and then the choices that were made. She called on the name of the Lord. She chose to call him El Roy. And at this point, she is praising the God who sees, not the son she is about to bear. Uh, we don't know for sure that she was, became a follower of the true God because at that time, Giving him the name El Roy could have just added him to the collection of her gods. But she could have also been become a follower of Yahweh. Ishmael is the first person God named before birth, but he's not the only one. Um, Isaac, King Josiah, Jesus, and John, John the Baptist were at least... Those are some that definitely were named before they were born. Did anybody look up information about Ishmael and Hagar that you found something really interesting that you didn't know before or that you think really helped understand this passage better? I had to ask that in the homework. I thought it was interesting. I, I, I read it many times, but to put this together is that Joseph was sold by Ishmaelites. So it says that they were present, you know, in that area. And that one of Abigail's husband was an Ishmaelite. Why does God give that information through scripture? It just it's just interesting how he, he showed that some of these things happened that were promised. Um, we don't have a lot of time to discuss Ishmael and the Arab nation, and I didn't have a whole lot of time to look into it either, but if you want to believe Wikipedia, it says the book of Genesis and Christian and Islamic traditions consider Ishmael to be the ancestor of the Arabs. In Islam, Ishmael is regarded as a prophet and an ancestor to Muhammad. He has also become associated with Mecca and the construction of Kaaba. So to the Arab nation, Ishmael is very, very important. So we'll be learning more about Ishmael and the problems that were caused in verse, chapters 21 and 25. But notice how God blesses even in this obstacle. He gives Hagar blessings for Ishmael. Just the fact that her son is going to have many children. It's a blessing, especially at that time. So now we move on to the years between Abram's 86th and 99th birthday. 13 years, ladies. What were you doing 13 years ago? Think about waiting from that time till now to have this happen. When, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram. From things said later, I feel Abram may have gotten pretty close to this son during these 13 years. And remember, they are now assuming this is their heir. And he's being treated that way. We don't have an account 
uh, either of what happened between Sarai and Hagar during this time, but we do know later on that things were not did not go well between them. So living in those tents might not have been real pleasant at some times. And especially if she still did serve as a servant to Sarai, as her servant. It says, and, and Abram said to him, uh, God said to him, I am God Almighty. This is the El Shaddai we talk about. The first time the Lord calls forth his name El Shaddai in scripture is right here. He seems to be telling Abram, I am able to fulfill the awesome hopes I have told you about through the years. You don't have to give up hope that the promises will be fulfilled, even in your old age. All your life and all your future in the fact, all your life lies in the fact that I am God Almighty. Very powerful couple words there. I am God Almighty. And then he says, walk before me and be blameless. So he says who he is, and he also tells him things that he should do. So get out your promises pages again. And let's look at this section 17. Um, one to eight. I gave you the promises that God said to him. Do we have any choices being made here? Abram falls on his face and worship. I would assume, or just um, okay, yeah. Prostrates himself. Yeah, Lord, the Lord. he chooses to worship God. Good. Any others? I'm hoping you're saying. I'm trying to show you that. This chapter has a whole lot of promises and quite a few choices and how they need, to, how they work together. Good choices and the promises and bad choices and the promises. Well, he says, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. What did Abram do? He didn't already, he didn't argue that he already had a son. He could have said, I do, I have him. He didn't complain and say he didn't believe. It says he fell on his face like Deb said. And then the Almighty continued with his promise and said, said behold my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Um, he changes Abram's name to Abraham and we've talked before about how important names were. And just think, every day when his servants or anybody talked to him, he was reminded that he was the father of nations with this one son. Uh, if Abram meant exalted father and Hughes, thought that that exalted father was referring to God. And Abraham, of course, means father of a multitude. I wonder if this name ever got kind of old to him and he didn't think too much about it, or if it was always a reminder. I gave you a list, I think, of some of the names and their meanings. You'll notice uh, Sarai's name doesn't change a lot in its meaning, but the fact that he changed it from Sarai to Sarah means this is the name God gave her. 
She said, and so we continue, for I made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you seemingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come to you. That's a very important part. You see how this is moving forward with more information on the covenant. This is an amazing thing for Abram. The blessing for him because of King Jesus is going to come from him. I guess this is where we should probably insert our Christmas lesson for today. To think that the ultimate King of Kings and Lord of Lords is coming from him. Now, remember in Hebrews, we Abram was seeing this from afar and he didn't know all that it entailed. But we know, we can look back. In fact, Matthew already was looking back when he said the book of, Gene in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abram, and then it goes through all those names. They knew it in Jesus' time and before. Uh, in Hebrews 11, 13, it says, they all died in faith, not having received the things promised, the son who was a king, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Remember, Abram didn't get land or that huge uh, family yet before he died. Except for Sarah's grave, he bought that in Israel. Verse 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout all generations. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. I'm so sure in this section, you saw a lot of the things repeated in this spiral that God had already said. Um, we won't go over them right now. So let's move on to the covenant sign is given. Circumcision is instituted in this section. Would someone care to read for me verses 9 to 14? Give me my mouth a break. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring, after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or brought with, bought with your money from any foreigner who is not your own, your, of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So God here has expanded his covenant. Some, I think it was Constable said, this was sort of a covenant within the covenant, the circumcision. Uh, he first assigns Abram a new name, and we saw how that's going to fit with his future, and then that sign of the covenant. I'm not sure why I keep getting circumcision to teach about, but I've had to do it several times in ladies' Bible study. I'm surprised I didn't get my kids of that, because I usually get him, too. <laughs> but... Um, so here it goes again. Even though I have looked at it several times, I still struggle to understand the full significance of this cutting of the flesh, making a sign that was basically hidden most of the time, 
And this was the sign God was giving his people that he was their God. Um, one thing to remember is that circumcision was not new. God didn't institute circumcision for Abram. The culture of that day did it quite a back, quite a bit, or some some cultures did it, and they were known as cultures that did it or didn't do it. Um, in the ancient Near East, it's strange. It was used sometimes as a a right uh, right. Before they got married, as this video it says, the new male in laws that would be us in my case would perform it, indicating that the groom was coming under the protection of their family in the new relationship. Strange, but that was one way it was used. The other way it was used is they sometimes circumcised as a part of the ritual of moving into puberty for boys. So it was a, a common thing that was done. But God's direction for circumcision is totally different. The Israelite hearer or reader was likely aware of this and would have seen that God was adopting a well-known practice and adapting it for a theological function. Yes, if we had time and expertise, we could think about things that God uses in our culture to help us understand and to, and to do things. I don't know if he still does that or not, but he did it here. What's different, though, with theirs? Did you note who was circumcised? Eight years old, eight days old. Um, that would have been uncommon because babies were very vulnerable to dying at this time. So you would not have circumcised such a small child. Although they do feel that by the seventh day, they would be more able to be, to survive. So that may be why the day was chosen. Although I know Andrew was circumcised within hours, but things are different now because they have much better ways of keeping them alive if something happens. Um, it said it, it, it was eight days old and every male throughout all generations. This next section is amazing to me again, where we see Gentiles being brought in possibly here whether born in your house or bought with money that would be slaves from any foreigner who is not your offspring. I think Eliezer was from another place too, wasn't he? He wasn't. So both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with money shall certainly be circumcised. Do you see? It's repeated. He's saying everybody. So shall my covenant, covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Like I said, I don't understand it completely, but it was a very important sign and it continued to be a very important sign. It involved Abram's powers of procreation. And that seems to be a really important part of it that it involved that. We should also note that even back in the Mosaic Law, there was a spiritual interpretation of circumcision. In, in Deuteronomy 10, 15, listen to this. Yet the Lord set his heart and love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. So even back then, we know he talks about that in the New Testament, but even back then, it was this whole thing of it being a heart issue too, not just the circumcision of the man. Um, I don't know if any of you had this question. I did, and I just this morning found uh, in... Uh, Constable, possible answer. I wondered what, how could women be part of God's people if they couldn't be circumcised? Now there is some mutilization, mutilation that happens in some cultures, but 
uh, girls were said to share the circumcision of first their fathers and then their husbands. That's how it, it circumcised in, in that condition. They were like under the male. So that's how they could be part of the the uh, people of God to serve something that went through our mind. Um, and then I had the passage in Romans 4, 11, and 12 about some of the New Testament concept of circumcision. In this act, Abram did not choose to make a commitment to God, but God asked for his commitment. God wanted to mark him as his own. So, in 17, 9 to 18, we have some promises from God to Abram. He says, I will, you, I shall, so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. And then any uncircumcised male shall be cut off, for he has broken my covenant. So he promised positive and negative there. All right, we better keep moving. In 15 to 21, Isaac is promised to Abram and Sarah. Uh, he changes Sarai's name in verse, in verse 15 to Sarah, and he says, I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. So finally, we have definitely Sarah's gonna be the mother. I will bless her and she will become nations. Kings and people shall come from her. Remember, kings are going to come from Abram, kings from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who is only 90, bear a child? And Abram said to God, oh, that Israel might live before you. So he's being promised all this, but he comes back to Ishmael. I think Ishmael was pretty important to him, pretty special. And so God has some things for Ishmael. I will establish my co covenant with him as an everlasting, an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I've heard you be Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes, and I will make him into a great nation. But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. So he gives those blessings for Ishmael. But he comes back, his plan is going to happen. He's going to get around that obstacle. He's going to still follow through. Um, in 15.4, he stated the heir would be Abram's biological son. Now as he changes her name, he also states that the heir has been, he's been talking about is Sarah's. And this is where the laughter begins. I forgot that Abram laughed too. And I always knew about Sarah, but I forgot that he did. Now some say this might not have been laughing like what a joke. This might have been a laughter of just being so happy. Uh, we don't know, but anyway, he laughed. And, you, and Isaac's son, you know, Isaac's name means laughter. However, once again, God does not make fun of Abram. He does not get upset with Abram possibly seeming ungrateful and bringing up Ishmael. He gives him a very strong answer. He even gave Ishmael those blessings. And this gives a more and complete picture of Ishmael's future. Uh, so God extends some of the covenant blessings to Ishmael, fruitful, 12 rulers, and a great nation. But God clearly states that the covenant program will come through Isaac. Um, I don't think I put this on yours because David just said the other night, there was another obstacle here. 
if Ishmael, if Ishmael had not been born, think about it, if Ishmael had not been born, Isaac would have gotten Abram's full inheritance immediately. So, in a way, they're going uh, their, their own way extra, took away a little bit of Isaac's blessings for a while. So you can look now on your page of promises and blessings um, and also choices. I saw mostly promises and blessings. I didn't see a lot of choices in here, although Abram and Sarah have to follow through on what was told them and they have to do what God asks. After the changing of Sarah's name and the promise to Ishmael, we move back to the following through of that covenant sign of circumcision. In verse 22, it says, when he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house and bought with money every male, it keeps on all that list again, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day. Abram is a man of action, and we, we see that happening here. As God had said to him, he was 99 years old when he was circumcised. I'm sure that wasn't pleasant. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old. From what I understand, that isn't pleasant when they get circumcised when they're older. And that very day, Abram and his son Ishmael were circumcised. And all the men of his house, again, it keeps saying this, all the men of his house, everybody, God wants their total household. Uh, you might remember in Joshua, we read, I think it's Joshua 5, we read, we read about how the Israelites had to circumcise every, all the males before they went into the promised land after their 40 years of wandering. That was a very dangerous thing to do. They had days, they had a while where all the men in the camp of Israel were healing. I think this could have been also a vulnerable time for them. Um, God is there and he was, Abram was willing to do it. Why didn't he do some one time and some another time? So he'd have people there to protect him. Everybody did it all at the same time. If you remember too, Jen, um, when we talked about Abram and taking his men born in his household up after the coalition of the kings to rescue Lot. There were 318 of them. So this isn't a small number of people that are incapacitated for a while. This probably is over 500 people because oh that 318 only yeah, included fighting yeah. men. So if you're thinking, oh, maybe 20 people, 50 people. No, we're talking hundreds of people maybe even upwards to more than 500 you know so you count all the little boys from eight days old and up and maybe all the elderly that don't fall into that 318 yeah wow and, and then think about what it was in going into the promised land how many would have been incapacitated for those days yes god constantly is doing things i'm finding to us to help us see we need to rely on him they had to trust him be obedient and then god would continue to work um this was a very important part of the covenant that was given to abram the circumcision was a very important part uh and of course we see that abram did follow through and circumcise his his household looking back um well i'm looking ahead looking back the rainbow was a sign of the covenant at noah i didn't realize the sign of the covenant at sinai was the sabbath 
but it says, I give you this as a sign, and circumcision is a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. So, Abram made a major choice when he decided to circumcise all his men and follow through on God's plans. So, looking back at the promises and choices, I realized that I didn't look at God's choices. What were some of his choices? We just have a couple minutes. Does anybody real quick have any choices that God made? So I just see it as all God's choices. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's right. at no time. I will make a covenant with you. I At no time did someone say, oh, by the way, I've believed and I've done what you wanted me to do. So circumcise me. It's always God. He's always saying, it's just a recognition of the, of the covenant that he has made. It's a sign of right. his covenant. Right. So it's just so consistent that he's teaching us that about ourselves. And then later he says, I'm going to circumcise your heart. You know, he does that. I don't, I don't do something that he is ob obligated then to circumcise my heart. He circumcises my heart. And then I know what's right in the world, you know, and I, and I obey him. So it's just so clear that God is teaching us from the beginning. And that's why I had this little thing about it's not really Abraham covenant. Like he did nothing. He, right. right. Yeah, God, God said, you do yeah. it. Yeah. He's just kind. He's, he's just the guy there that God is using to and yet it does talk about his faith being what you know so yeah. there's that there's that kind of pulling two things there yeah but we we see him constantly not having faith you know yeah. he he decided to he he's the one that went into hagar it was his decision and yet um, he's listed in the hall of faith as having faith exactly it, but it's, it's not credit. That's not of any credit to him. No, but no. he had it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's a it's just such a clear understanding of God. It's God's choice in all of this, and and you don't even have to be of the line of Abraham because all of his household was right. chosen, right? You now and circumcised to show that they were chosen. Right. So it's just so comforting to know that um, I don't have to be in the right lineage. I don't have to be do the right things. I don't have to say the right things. He chose me and he has given us a sign of that. And so but and after he chose them, he had, he also had things and even in choosing, he had things they had to do. Definitely. And and yep. that, that's right. So yep. God chose to be Yahweh. He chose to be I am. He chose to be the promise keeper. And he just chose or is to show what is right for his people. And above all, he chose grace and direction to his people. I think that's a big thing. Once again, uh, like Emily said, we just see grace coming over and over. And this chapter is just full of it just full of God's grace to them. Um, we are come, looking forward to Christmas. I wish we would have time to recall the promises that God made regarding the coming of Jesus. We know all the choices, some of the choices he made, because we're so, so tiny, we don't understand it all. But if we could just go back and remember all the promises he gave about Jesus coming, his birth, his death, his resurrection, and then to believe that those promises about his coming again are going to happen. That's what's so special about Christmas too, that we have those promises. We saw Jesus come as Emmanuel, and now we have his second coming to anticipate. In these next weeks, let's rejoice in God's plan for his son and that he came as king from Abram's line in skin to live amongst, as Emmanuel amongst his people. Today, those of us who are walking as God's children have been chosen by him. We must choose to act on his promises to us. 
Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you, you should go. I will count to you with my eye upon you. Reread that verse to yourself. Abram slowly learned to do this, and I pray that we will also. Now let's leave our computers and make the choice to listen and act on what God sees and also God's almighty, what God Almighty instructs, teaches, and counsels us to do. Amen and amen. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Yeah, you too. See you next week. Thank you.